come and sit with me for a while. I'm going to share an excerpt out of my blog, The Road Less Traveled. And all I can say is that death comes to us in many different ways, but the constant is that it's permanent. Thank you. Evolution. Audrey visited me while I was in the hospital. She's my best friend. The statement was repeated back to me a couple of times. Once by her daughter while I was up at the hospital and they were getting my friend ready to go home. And once by a family member when I went to the daughter's home to see that my friend was safe and resting comfortably. Best friend? How did I get to that place of honor in a simple little old French lady's life? How did I evolve into such an important person to her? And how did she so thoroughly and completely win my loyalty and affection? Our relationship was born out of mutual need. She needed me to care just as desperately as I needed to be of service. I care, plain and simple. I care about people and humanity and suffering and loss. Oh, our relation didn't start out that way. I showed up at her doorstep. She was one of my very first clients when I started my social work. I was to help her with some household chores and with a shower. I put on a pleasant smile and I knocked on her door. I'm from Catholic Social Services. I'm here to give you a hand, I introduced myself. I don't need anything, she said the tiny little woman with determination. Well, I did manage to get in the door that day. I think I vacuumed for her. Over the next year and a half, I would do all kinds of chores for her. Periodically, she would be in the hospital and I wouldn't even know as I would get no phone call or anything. It was a slow process, <coughs> excuse me, but we bonded. This past Christmas, I put up decorations for her and even put up her Christmas tree. She had a couple of nativities and it was lovely. As she got weaker and weaker, I treated her with kid gloves. She was so very fragile and needed all the TLC that I could give her. Then I showed up one day and her daughter told me her mama was in ICU. I'm glad I went. She was a bit moody, but she tried to be pleasant. She hated that hospital. When I showed up at her daughter's house, I had a little Catholic prayer book and a rosary in hand. After all, what do you bring to someone who is so weak and dying? Flowers? Flowers didn't even occur to me, actually. I stopped by a friend's house before I took off out of town to visit my other friend, the ailing one. I didn't have time to stop, but felt compelled to stop. My friend was happy to see me and got me some strawberries and a fork to go with my lunch. When I left her, I was well armed for my deathbed visit. My friend offered the Bible and the rosary for my other friend. I'm not Catholic and these things were a little foreign to me. I smiled a sort of embarrassed and awkward smile when I got funny looks from the family as I entered the house with the Bible and the holy beads. I let them know that I was not the clergy, but you know, maybe I was. I should have prayed for her. I did in the hospital a couple of times. I don't know why I didn't. I guess because she was surrounded by everyone and so very weak. She was sitting up on the side of the bed and I sat next to her with my arm propped up, propping up her back as one of her sons, I think it was read a couple of entries out of the Bible slated for saints on May 7th and May 9th. It was the 8th of May, but there were no word for the 8th. In the entry on May 7th, the little book was speaking of God's mercy and his grace and thanking God for them and petitioning God for them, I believe. Then the entry for May 9th was about the Lord blessing his faithful servants on earth from heaven and from an and of an eternal reward, or something like that. It was so sweet. We were all in awe of the goodness of God and the word that had come forth. The daughter, a different one than the one that I knew of in times past, that was standing there, told me that I brought a good word. Through tear-soaked eyes, I told her that I brought a good God. That was on Monday. My hectic life was insanity on Tuesday, and Wednesday was no better. This afternoon, I made the time to call and check on her. The daughter told me that my friend had quietly slipped away. She was sitting up in her favorite chair and died. I'm sorry, I told the daughter. What could I say? We knew that she was going to die. At least she went quickly, I lamely added. When is the memorial, I politely asked. Tomorrow at 10 in Scottsdale. She was a loner and it'll be a quiet service. Then we'll have a service in Canada later on, she added. At least she gets to fly one more time. 
The daughter was glad for that fact, but we both knew that it wouldn't be the same. And that was all. There were no great theatrics. There were no tears in the telling or the receiving. She had passed away on Tuesday. I wasn't home when my daughter tried to call me. When the daughter tried to call me and no one mentioned the missed call. The daughter had only asked for me and had left no message. I had cried all of my tears as I cried myself to sleep when I wrote what I know. I woke up the following morning and the tears continued and then there were none. Only a resolution in my spirit that my friend was going away and I would never see her again. Not in this life anyway. One thing she asked me though while she was still up there in the hospital. I had told her that I would say my goodbyes there as I knew that her daughter lived quite a ways away and that I wouldn't be getting up there to see her. I'm not dead yet, she had stone faced told me. Then a little while on before I left, she asked me, you won't forget me, will you? I kissed her forehead and promised that I would never forget her. I will never forget her, or Dorothy, or Dorothy, or Dorothy, or Ethel, or Joe, or Eva, or Viola, or Harvey, or Joyce, or Grandma, or Uncle Donnie, or Kenny, or Milton, or Michael, or Crystal, or Lilia Faith, or Delany. I still have Delany's rose. She was just a baby, my friend's grandbaby. Their memories are etched to my mind and their spirits are burned into my soul. I hung up my phone and got out of my car and I headed on into the hospital. I have a friend there and I know he'd be happy to see me. Death Watch. The family gathers, the dark, far, the dark clouds hang in the air, heavy with pending grief as the rays of hope are dwindling. The darkness is prevailing. It's time for the dearly beloved to depart. At the beginning of the watch, there is much sadness, pacing, and wringing of hands. There is high anxiety and despair. Then the weariness settles in, and the laborer's breathing gets weak and shallow. There comes a shift. The anxiousness that clung to the hope of life gives way to anxiousness that looks for the blessed relief of the passing. The concerned phone calls, inquiring of the well-being of the deathly ill, have come to a lull and the callers are more concerned for the grieving than for the afflicted. Is she still hanging in there shifts to, are you okay? How are you holding up? The shift appears to me to be an overall yielding to the finality of death and seems to serve as a preparation of the heart to deal with the loss. I believe that God allows the ritual of the death watch to strengthen the hearts of the ones who are left behind. During the agony of the holding on to life by the person that is dying comes the acceptance of letting go by those who are watching the losing battle for breath. As the breathing begins to lessen and the heart ceases to send vital blood through the body, the witnesses find themselves holding their breath as they watch and wait to see if the pause in breathing is permanent. As the deathbed patron's heartbeat slows, the observer's quickens. The once dreaded thought of the death of the loved one is replaced with a quiet resolve and acceptance. There is not a man alive stronger than the call of the spirit to return to its maker. I wonder if at the crucifixion of Christ, if the beloved of Jesus came to the place of acceptance of Christ's imminent death and even agonized to know that the suffering of their loved one was over. Maybe Mary cried, even covering her eyes with her hands as she couldn't bear to watch her son die. Maybe she whispered out to John the beloved, is it over? Longing for the deliverance. For the release. Then Jesus, fulfilling the necessity of giving his life for many, comforts her weary soul with, It is finished, as he yields his spirit, even unto death.